Well, this is a Christmas season and uh, Christmas is upon us. Uh, it, some people would say it's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, 2020 has redefined the most wonderful time, but it is still the most wonderful time uh, of the year. Uh, I wonder whether, for those of you who are in the room uh, with me uh, and those of you online, you can put this on the chat. When you think of Christmas, what words come to your mind? Uh, what words come to your memory when you think of Christmas time? Uh, so we'll go ahead and shout it out in this room and on the uh, chat. Can you just write what words come to your mind as you think of Christmas? Toffee nut latte. Very good, right? How many of you, uh, what comes to your mind is some toffee nut latte from uh, Starbucks and Coffee Bean, right? Anybody else? What words come to your mind? Sorry? Baby Jesus, Baby Jesus right? So that comes to your mind. Uh, online, could you put it in the chat? What comes to your mind as you think of Christmas? Celebrating Jesus, right? Great. Um, all very holy here, lah. Uh, but I think also what comes to our mind are things like uh, shopping, uh, presents, uh, the crowds have returned. You know, what is this pandemic we talk about? Uh, the malls are quite crowded these days. Uh, we think of food, right? How many of you looking forward to some nice Christmas food? Uh, how many of you begun some nice Christmas food eating already? I know, I've seen on some of you on Instagram, right? Um, and so we enjoy the food and the season. Uh, we think of things like light or star. Uh, we think of manger. Uh, we think of gifts that happen. We sometimes think of the wise men. I want to introduce uh, a word that really echoes through the Christmas story. Uh, and this week and next week, we're going to uh, begin a Christmas series because we're in the season of Christmas. And I pray that you will be encouraged uh, but also be deeply transformed. That's been my prayer. Uh, I hope you will track with me, whether online or in this room, uh, that you want to be changed today. Uh, and that's why we have gathered. We've not just gathered because it's the thing we do. We've gathered because we've come to the, to the house of God in order for the Lord to transform us, to make us more and more like Him. Uh, and the word that I want us to think a little bit about today is the word glory. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure whether it's a word that you're familiar with. Um, I'm not even sure if this is working. Okay, there we go. Uh, but it's the word glory, right? And uh, it's a word that we don't use very often in normal uh, speech, right? You kind of don't, you know, your kids don't come to you, you as a father and say, Father, I love the glory that you bring into this household, right? So it's a, it's a word that we don't often use very much. But it's a word that's steep and heavy and weighted in the scriptures uh, because it is used to describe God. Uh, and it's one of those really difficult words to figure out. Uh, it's like, um, you know, there's some words in, in English that's easy to understand. You know, so for instance, if I use the word table, I can point to an object and say, this is a table and you can understand what that is. You can see it, you can experience it, you can touch it. But the word glory is a little bit more like the word beauty. It's a little harder to figure out, a little harder to define. Uh, but it's a word that means weighted. It's a word that means majestic. It's a word that means brilliant and powerful and perfect. But it's a word that's used to describe the holiness of God that's been made manifest. And so how do we see and know and experience the holiness of God? It's through the glory of God. Now, why is this an important word? Because the Bible says that God's desire is that all the earth be covered and filled with the glory of God. And so as we think about this in today and through this season, I pray that we will get some insight to what does it mean for us to bear the glory and then to give glory to God. So that's the word that I want us to think a little bit about today. Next week, there's a different word that we're going to look at uh, as we reflect over this Christmas season. Uh, but with this one word comes a biblical idea. And this one biblical idea is the idea of the incarnation. Uh, everybody say incarnation. In, uh, on the chat, would you write just that word incarnation? Uh, some of you are inka who? Um, right? What does the word incarnation mean? You won't find the word in the scriptures, but it's a concept and a truth, a doctrine, as it were, that is permeated through the scriptures. Uh, what does it mean? It really means this, that God has become flesh. God has become man, and he's come to dwell 
uh, among us. It comes from two Latin words, uh, and really those two words means in the flesh. So God all-powerful has come to us in the flesh. And we see this uh, in the song of the angel who says, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And so the series that we're starting today is just called The Angel's Song. Uh, and we're going to look at it today, part one, uh, and next week, part two. And so would you join me in prayer as we continue this time of worship? Uh, Father, we thank you for your presence that is in this room. We thank you that your presence is with everybody who's tuning in, whatever room they find themselves in. And Lord, we pray today that you would be glorified in the preaching and in the listening of your word. That somehow, Lord, you will take the truth of your word and you will make it real to every heart who's listening. Open our eyes, change our lives today because we have come to seek you and to come before you, Lord, as humble servants desiring more of you in our lives and in our world. And all who agreed with me said, Amen. We want to pick the story up from Luke chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn to it. Uh, if you're at home, you can get to it online as well or open up a Bible. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 2 because that's where a lot of this Christmas story is going to come from. Uh, we're going to begin from verse 8. But just before we get to verse 8, what has happened in the story is Mary and Joseph have already come to Bethlehem and they've given birth. So Jesus has already arrived, he's a baby, and he's in the manger uh, in Mary and Joseph's home. And though now we pick it up from verse 8. And in the same region, so what's this region? This area is a place called Bethlehem. Uh, what we know about it, it's in the very hilly environment, but very fertile. And so oftentimes you find shepherds uh, out there who are you know, feeding their flock. Saiba, you think about a pregnant Mary, Mary who had to go up towards Bethlehem. So it was a very tough journey for Mary. But that's the region, that's the environment, the geography that we are in. And what it says this, that there were shepherds. Now, a little background about shepherds is shepherds were considered lowly people in their society. In fact, they were so low that uh, the, you know, they were like the second lowest rung in a society. Uh, you know, they were not allowed to give any kind of testimony in court because they were deemed to be unreliable. Uh, and so these shepherds were ordinary folk, they were uh, simple folk, and they were doing their job. They were out in the field keeping watch. Uh, this is an interesting word because in the Greek, this word actually also means imprisoned. So now you think about this, right? Because some of us can identify with this, right? They were doing their day job and they were felt like they were in prison. Can I get a witness? No, don't put your hand up, huh? <laughs> Uh, especially all those on my stuff, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, like, you know, like you may feel like you're in a job and you feel you're stuck and things are not changing and things are not moving forward and things are not uh, getting any, any better and you're just stuck in this day job, day in, day out. That's what this word means, right? And so the shepherds were doing their ordinary everyday job, the humdrum, the doldrum of working, uh, bringing the sheep out, bringing them back, bringing the sheep out, bringing them back. And they were doing this as they were watching over their flock by night. As someone once said, the night is a dark time. Uh, and in this season of it being dark and uncertain, they were watching their flock. Now, what we know historically is this, that these were very unique flocks because these were Bethlehem shepherds who looked after Bethlehem sheep. Now, for most of us, that doesn't mean very much. But to them, this is what it meant. It meant that these were the sheep that were read and looked after for the temple sacrifice. So that's going to be key for us. And so Luke, who's writing the story, gives information that to you and me, just gl we glance over it, but to the early readers, they would have understood that these were significant sheep because they were going to be used as sacrifice in the temple. Now, verse 9 tells us this, as they were doing their ordinary, everyday jobs, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now, somebody needs to hear this. In the midst of your doldrum, in the midst of what seems ordinary, in the midst of your everyday job, have faith to believe that suddenly God can break in. 
Have faith to believe that God can come and meet you where you're at. In fact, somebody tuning in online right now, you need to hear this, that you may think that God has forgotten you, but I came to say to somebody, God has not forgotten you. In fact, he wants to break into your world. The supernatural wants to come into the natural and bring transformation into this world. Can somebody say amen? And so this angel comes and appears to them, these shepherds, and the glory of the Lord. And this is the word that we're going to rest on a little bit. This is the first time in the story we see this word, the glory. And it is a scary glory because we are told that it is the glory of the Lord. It's not the glory that the angel had. The angel was a reflection of this glory. And maybe you and I as well are meant to be carriers of a reflection of God's glory into this world. And I want you to know that this has got a preposition that says the glory of the Lord. Everybody say of. In the chat, would you write the word of? Because we're later on going to see a different preposition when it comes to the glory. But this speaks of the glory of God, the majesty, the perfection, the manifestation of who God is has been reflected upon this angel so much so that it shone brightly. I wonder how many of you would like to have been those shepherds. Your job is just doing ordinary things and suddenly there is this bright, overwhelming light that enters in. You know, the shepherds rightly felt great fear. And I think it's true that if we truly understand the glory of God, it would lead us to a place of falling on our knees as we have sung. When we hear the angel voices, the voices that give glory to God, and their response was fear, trepidation. They were overwhelmed. And remember, this is how many angels that have shown up? One. One angel showed up. And the glory was so overwhelming that the shepherds felt fear. So I want you to think about this. When God in all his glory, his weighted stature, his perfection... The beauty that we cannot even comprehend. The majesty that's beyond the words that I have to know how to express. Enters into a room we are forced to get on our knees. And that's what happened there. They were filled with trepidation. You see, why do I want us to be stirred today is this. Because sometimes as Christians, we have lost the wonder and the majesty that is God. We think of God very lightly, very flippantly, and therefore our prayers are small, our faith is little. But here we are told that the glory of God from one angel that was just a reflection from this one angel caused these shepherds to shudder in fear. May you and I always carry a circumspectness about us because when we think of God's glory, this is incomprehensible. His power and majesty is beyond our capacity to fully even comprehend. And so this angel then gives an announcement. We're going to skip a couple of verses, but we're going to come back to the announcement in a moment, right? So we're going to move down to verse 13. And in verse 13, we are told now the next event takes place. And suddenly... Everybody say suddenly, right? I, especially if you're in the room, I want you to engage with me because all I can see is your top half of your face. Huh? So I don't know if you're smiling or not, but I assume you are, okay? So if you're online, engage with me as well, right? And uh, write the word suddenly because God can come in suddenly. I don't know what's going on in your world. It may be all going down. You may be filled with fear like the shepherds said, but suddenly God can break in and change our world and change our circumstance. But here's what happened. Then suddenly there was with this one angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. You know what this means? It means this, that there was not just one small angel and a little choir that came. This word multitude means an army. So imagine the expanse of an army ready to go to war. The shepherds already freaking out from one angel's glory. And suddenly, 
there is a multitude that breaks in. Isn't this an amazing moment? Isn't this unbelievable? Why suddenly is this, uh, this angelic host breaking in? Why suddenly having this multitude proclaiming glory to God? Because the announcement that the shepherds heard was so amazing that heaven said one angel is not enough. What the announcement was when the angel came to bring this announcement to the shepherds, it was so incredible that heaven just broke in and this multitude declared glory to God. You don't seem very excited. So let me try and illustrate. Uh, some years ago, uh, when traveling was allowed, you know, how many of you remember the good old days when traveling was allowed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No? Uh, it seems like a long time ago. Uh, I went on a holiday and I went to uh, watch a musical. Many of you know that I enjoy the theater and I went to a, uh, watch a musical. Uh, and this was the Color Purple on Broadway. And it had an amazing cast. Uh, and I sat down and I heard the music and everything. It was such a moving story. I loved everything about it. And then came this moment in the middle of Act Two. This is not the end of the play. This is in the middle of the play. This uh, actress, her name's Cynthia Erivo, she sings a song called I'm Here. And when she finishes the song, everybody in the theater spontaneously stands up and cheers and claps and for minutes on end just are screaming. People are crying. People are moved with emotion. It's just an overwhelming feeling. It was such a powerful performance that everybody reacted spontaneously with praise. I want you to see that what we did in that theater, heaven did on that first morning. When Jesus was born, when the angel came and gave the announcement, heaven couldn't stand still. Heaven couldn't wait. Heaven couldn't be quiet anymore. Heaven broke in and said, glory to God in the highest. Heaven just uh, broke out and said, we cannot be silent anymore. And it's never, ever happened. There is no other record in scripture of a moment like this. There is no other moment when, when the angels were so rapturous in their praise, but this moment has been recorded. And I cannot imagine what those shepherds must have uh, felt like. Because can you imagine one angel full of fear, suddenly a multitude that declared glory to God in the highest. I want you to think about this. The angels have seen some incredible moments in history. The angels were there when the universe was created. Now, I always thought about this, and I don't know whether you ever think about the beginning of the universe, but I think it would be quite amazing, right? Out of darkness, God says, let there be light. And bang, this universe comes into existence. Planets come together. And the angels were there. But there's no record of the angels going, glory to God in the highest. We have an a example in Isaiah when he sees this incredible vision of heaven. And in that, we have the angels proclaiming, holy, holy, holy. But no major multitude declaring glory to God in the highest. Even when Jesus was ministering on earth, Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Anybody would think that's a pretty cool miracle? Nobody thinks that's a... I think it's a pretty cool miracle. Yeah? Okay, you... You, uh, you don't... Master, but I can put hand now. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think that's a pretty cool miracle. A little bit of food multiplied to feed everybody. 12 basketfuls left over. Pretty cool miracle. No angelic song. The angels didn't go, woohoo! That's amazing. Remember the storm? When they were in that storm and they had to experience that storm? That's the storm. Oops. Ooh, la la. Say, Pucci. Creation. Very good. If this was actually, you know, like a... a... Okay, la. You, you trust me, huh? okay? So there was a storm. But in that storm, God speaks to the storm and says, peace, be still. And the storm quietens down, right? 
Would you think that's a pretty powerful thing? But in that moment, no angelic song. And then what about the resurrection of Lazarus? Now, this is a guy who's been dead for three days, decomposing already. Jesus comes and says, Lazarus, come forth. And this dead, decomposing body comes back out, still with the grave clothes around him. That's a pretty awesome miracle. But even in that awesome miracle, there was no glory to God in the highest. It is this moment where heaven says glory to God in the highest. It's this moment where the heavens are broken open and the angels come to be overwhelmed in their reaction and the response to the news. They declared glory to God. They were giving adoration. They were giving praise for something that God had done, something that God had already proclaimed, and they came to bring this announcement. It was this announcement that caused this reaction. What was the announcement? I'm glad you ask. Because it's in verse 10. So let's look at this announcement. In verse 10 of Luke chapter 2, it says this. And the angel, there's one angel, remember, who had come and revealed himself to the shepherds. The angel said to them, fear not. Why? Because remember, they were afraid. Fear not, for behold, which basically means pay attention, bold. This is, you know, something you need to highlight. What does it say? It says, uh, for behold, I bring you good news. Everybody say good news. You see, the angel came to bring good news. I want you to understand this. The angel did not come to give good advice, but came to bring good news. Now, what's the difference? The difference is this. News is something about, uh, news is truth about something that already has taken place. You see, a way to think about this is like this. You know, uh, let's say we are a nation, right? All of us in this room, we're a nation. And right now, we hear that there is an enemy who's going to come to kill us and destroy us. So we need some strategy to defend ourselves. In that moment, what we need are wise people to come and tell us what we need to do in order to, uh, you know, uh, fight against this enemy that's coming to encroach upon us. Now, let's say along the way, as this enemy was coming to us, Somebody else comes and destroys and overtakes this invading army to us. At that point, we don't need advice. At that point, somebody just has to come and give us an announcement. The enemy is defeated. There is no more an enemy invasion coming to us. So I want you to see this. When Jesus was born, it was not that God came to give us advice for how we're meant to live. It was God coming to say, I've come to give you an announcement. I've come to give you some news. Everything is going to change because God has come to dwell with us. God has become man. God has come to walk in our shoes, to walk upon our streets. And because of this one moment, everything is going to change. This was the announcement that caused heaven to explode with excitement. This was the announcement that caused heaven to say glory to God in the highest. It is such a powerful announcement because Christianity is not just about good advice. It is about a truth that has happened in history. And because of this truth, this historical reality, everything in the world is different today. And this news, mind you, was not for Christians. This news was for all the people. And I like to remind us that Christmas is not meant for Christians. Christmas is meant for humanity, for all people. So right now, maybe you're tuning in, maybe you're in this room and you don't believe in Jesus. You need to know that this moment, this Christmas story, the very first Christmas story is for you because Jesus came and he became a man for all the people. And then in verse 11, the angel says this, but for unto you. Even though the message and the truth of Christmas is universal in its scope, it is personal, its application. That God loves you. He knows your life, your story, and he has come for you personally. And so today, if you want to respond to the news, you individually, personally, you need to respond to this news perhaps in the same way that the angels did. Because it says, for to you is born this day. I love the Christian story because it's not myth, it's historical. In a particular time, in a particular place, 
We are told that Caesar Augustus was the emperor in that time. We know that Quirinius was the governor of that region. This is a historical moment. And so Jesus didn't come in a myth and in a storytelling uh, fairy tale. He came in history on a particular day. And because he came, history is forever changed. Life is forever different. And in that announcement, the angel said this, that in this city now there is a savior. He has come to rescue us. Now, some of you are asking, rescue us from what? Good question. Please come back next week. Because next week, tune in next week, we're going to answer the question, what did he rescue us from? If he is our savior, what has he saved us from? And this Christ, this savior is uh, Christ, the Lord, the anointed one, the Messiah. He is fully God, but we are told he is born as a baby. Fully God, yet fully man. And that's what we call the incarnation. But here's the thing. Let me ask you this question, especially if you're a Christian. What does the incarnation do for you? Does it cause you to go glory to God? Not really. Isn't that weird? When we think of Christmas and the story of Christmas, we think of the, the nice baby, we think of the fool, we think of the wise men and the presents. But there isn't something inside of us that breaks forth and goes glory to God. This totally changes everything about my life. This totally changes everything about me. Glory to God. Why? Because I think sometimes today, when we think of giving glory to God, when we think of giving adoration and praise to God, we do it because we want God to do certain things for us. And when he does, then we give him glory. Right? So for instance, you want a job promotion and you get the job promotion and then you, in a very good way, say, praise God, praise God. You know, the glory to God, he opened up a door. When you were sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, gives you a good bill of health, you say glory to God because you want to be healed and whole. But when we think upon the incarnation, when we think of Jesus coming, sometimes, and this is the danger, my friend, sometimes we get so jaded, we get so uh, numb to the reality of it that we've stopped thinking upon its truth. And therefore, our faith is very shallow because we say, God, we want to praise you only when you do the things that we want you to do. But we forget to praise you for the things that you've already done. But it is that truth, the truth of the incarnation that forever changes us. You see, we go from glory to glory, not because we have deeper understanding of newer things. We go from glory to glory because we have a deeper truth and a revelation of truth already revealed to us. Why do we give glory to God? I'd like to suggest maybe we need to be like the angels who in this season, we think upon the incarnation and we ask ourselves, and this is the one question I want you to leave with and to think upon the whole week. What does the incarnation mean to you? You see, because we live in a world where people try to pull down the incarnation. We question it. How is it possible that one person can be God and man at the same time? We ask ourselves, the how is it possible? And in doing that, we fail to see the truth of what it can do to change us forever. It fails to cause us to sing glory to God. See, I'd like to suggest this. This is a meme from a few seasons ago. This is an angel. The angels gave glory to God because of the incarnation. Here's my invitation. Be like these angels. Respond with faith and glory to God for what he has already done. See, don't just worship God for what he does for you. Now go ahead and do that. If God answers a prayer, he opens the door, he gives you an opportunity, please give glory to God. But also worship God for what he has already done for you. Don't become jaded from the incredible truth because heaven gets so excited that the God of the universe put on flesh and came and dwelt among us. What does that mean to your heart? Does it bubble inside of you to say glory to God? Let me put it in a different way, maybe a simpler way. Let the incarnation bring joyful adoration. Would you say it out loud on the count of three? One, two, three. 
And would you write it in the chat? One, two, three. Let the incarnation bring joyful adoration. Just so you remember, would you turn to someone next to you and don't shout too loud, but uh, tell them, uh, let the incarnation bring joyful adoration. You see, when it comes to the truth that God has come, Emmanuel, God is with us. God is here in our midst. Does it cause your heart to worship him? Because heaven does. And so I've got a simple assignment for you. Because I know that we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. So I've got seven days and a seven-day assignment for you. Are you okay with that? Even if you're not, I'm going to give it to you, lah. So I hope you will do it. But maybe you're going to need to take some screenshots or take some notes for this. But I'm going to give you seven truths and blessings for why we can give praise to God because of the incarnation. You see, what I'm inviting you to do is I want you to think a little bit more. What does the incarnation mean to you? And I'm going to ask you to do this. Maybe some of you are saying, well, I can't really think about it because I don't know if I fully believe it was real. Just put that aside for now. Assume that it is real and start to think, if it was real, what would it mean to me personally? What difference does it make to my life if this is true? Because that's where I think God is going to awaken some of us to the reality that the angels saw. And that's why they broke in with a multitude saying glory to God. Are you ready? Seven very quick things I'm going to talk about. The first is this. If the incarnation is true, then heaven is real. Because if the incarnation is true, then it says this, that God who dwells in heaven has come to reveal to us that there is a place beyond this. And if this is true, it means this, that this life is not the be-all and end-all. In this life, you may have struggle, you may have pain, you may have difficulty, you may have sickness, but this life is not the end-all because there is a heavenly reality that is still made present in our world today. And because Jesus came, you and I can have the confidence that we too can go to where he once uh, came from. That is reason for us to live in a way that's different, to give glory to God. Number two. It tells us this, that we are absolutely loved. Absolutely loved. If the God of the universe would leave everything and come and chase after you and me to find us wherever we are, why would he do it? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm sure many of you remember this wonderful movie called Finding Nemo. I remember the story, right? Nemo got lost. And we always think that the story is about the cute little Nemo. But I always think the story is about the father. Anybody remember the father's name? Marlin. And the father goes on this incredible journey to find Nemo across the ocean. Ends up in Australia, which I guess is the ends of the earth. The story of Nemo is a small reflection of the heart of God who has come to pursue you to the nth degree. He gave up his glory to come and be amongst us. How do you know that you are loved? You know that you're loved because he pursues you. And I came to say he is still pursuing you. And sometimes he comes in a, uh, in a storm. Sometimes he comes in a burning bush. Sometimes he comes in the clouds. But he is pursuing you right now in your life as you're going through all that you're going through. God is still pursuing you. And we can know that we are loved, not because he answers the prayers that we want him to answer. We know that we are loved because he came and was born as a baby and lived a life and died upon a cross for us. The third truth is this, is that if the incarnation is real, then it tells us that God is knowable. We can know him. And it tells us this, that God wants to be known. It means that if you and I, like the wise men, seek him and pursue him back, we can know God. We can understand his heart. It is not just for the smart or for the intelligent. It's for the diligent, for those of us who will say, I want to seek and I want to pursue 
God. If the incarnation is real, then it tells us that God hasn't left us alone, but he's revealed himself to us. Anybody knows who this guy is? Thor. Now, Thor is a pretty strong chap, from what I understand. Now, Thor had a creator. Do you know who created Thor? Stan Lee. Okay, so Stan Lee is the guy who created this character. So this is a comic character. It's not a real character, right? You know, uh, Chris Hemsworth is not Thor. Okay, this is a character. So Stan Lee created Thor. Now, if you think about it, how can Thor know his creator? The only way Thor can know that Stan Lee exists is if Stan Lee draws himself and writes himself in the comics that he creates for Thor. Go and think about this. When Jesus came, Jesus came to show us and to reveal to us that we have a creator. And the only way we can know that we have this creator God is if he chose to come into our world to reveal to us who he is and who God is. So God can be known as we seek and pursue him. And it tells us that God desires to be known as well. And that's news for us to give glory to God. I don't know where is this. This is number four. The fourth thing, if the incarnation is true, is this. It tells us that we have a faithful God, that he keeps his promises. Do you know, a one scholar did some study to try and figure out how many, how many prophecies needed to be fulfilled for Jesus to be born. About 300. Statistically, quite a massive impossibility. But all those prophecies were fulfilled. Everything from the location, Bethlehem. The Old Testament prophet said that the, the Messiah would come to Bethlehem. That, he, uh, that Jesus would be born to a virgin. All of this has been prophesied thousands of years before. For those prophecies to come true, it tells us that we have a faithful God. And if he's true in the scriptures, to come in, 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 in a body form as a baby, he's true to us today. And so if he gives you a word, you can have faith and confidence in that word because he is same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It is reason for us to go glory to God. Number five is this. It tells us that sin is horrible and horrific. It is so bad that it requires God to come in his very nature to come upon this earth. We couldn't solve it on our own. We needed the goodness of God, the perfection of God. Our goodness is insufficient, but here we have God who has come to deal with sin. Remember, in Bethlehem, the sheep that they were looking after was going to become the sheep that was going to be slaughtered in the temple. Luke masterfully giving us a foreshadow because this baby would one day grow up and this baby would become the lamb of the world who will die upon the cross. And because of his death, sin is forever defeated and somebody should go glory to God. Because heaven knew the truth of this moment and heaven broke in and went glory to God. Number six. It tells us that God truly, truly understands. Whatever you're going through, we have a God who's not far removed from our life. He knows what it's like to live on earth. He understands family dynamic. You know, if you read the scriptures, right? He, he was ministering and trying to do some things and some of his family members were like, what is he doing? What is he doing? Therefore, Jesus had to put everybody out. He understands what hard work must be like because he was a carpenter and he had to work hard. He understands what poverty is like because he came into poverty. He understands what pain and suffering and abandonment and isolation. He understands all of that. He knows us more than we ever give him credit. And we have a God that we can cry to and pray to and sing to because he understands our plight. You know, in physics, there's a concept called sympathetic resonance. Everybody say sympathetic resonance. I'm not sure if you've ever heard this concept before, but it's quite interesting. Uh, it happens in music. So if I had a piano, not, not one of these pianos, but like an old-fashioned piano with the strings, but I had a piano here and I had another piano here. If I hit the keys E, or any key, what? if I hit that key, what happens is the string vibrates. Right? So there's a single string and the string vibrates. It's a, the string that's E. Ding! Oh, can I sing? Ding! When this string vibrates, the key of E, if I have another piano here, the string that is E also starts to vibrate. It's called sympathetic resonance. Why does this string vibrate? 
because the resonance is the same. This string feels this, this noise and says, I too will feel your movement. Do you know, whenever we go through pain and difficulty, we have a God who understands that his sympathetic resonance resonates with our pain because he knows what it's like to be abandoned. He knows what it's like to be left alone. He knows what it's like to be ridiculed. He knows what it's like to be hanging, uh, hanging on a cross for our sake. Surely, if that truth is real, it must cause us to go glory to God. And the last thought I have for you is this. If the incarnation is real and true, it must mean that Christianity is entirely unique. It cannot just be another religion. It cannot just be, this is just a thing I do because, you know, uh, I want to make sure that my life is proper because I have some religion that I can fill in some box. No, it means this, that this faith is entirely different. Because where religion says, I've got to behave and be good in order to get to heaven, this story tells us that God in his goodness came so that we could know him. It is entirely different from every other story. We don't have any other faith that tells us it's God, it's creator, put on flesh and came and dwelt among us. What does it mean to you that Christ, that Jesus was born for you today? What does it mean for you that he has come into the world? I would like to invite you to let the incarnation bring joyful adoration in your heart towards him. As we wrap this up, we want to end the story with the shepherds. See, the shepherds, after this major announcement, they say, we better go to Bethlehem. So listen to what the text says. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing. I want you to notice that the shepherds didn't say, let us go over to Bethlehem and see if this thing has happened. You see, they believed. They believed this announcement. They accepted that this baby born was the Savior. Because of their faith, and notice they're going to move from fear to faith. Because of their faith, they then saw the sign of the baby Jesus. You see, we, we want it the other way. We want to see the signs before we have the faith. And I'd like to suggest maybe today, if you will say, I believe this good news. I believe that God has come to dwell among us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Maybe if we believe first, we will see the signs of God's glory all around us. Because they left glorifying and praising God. Let me wrap it up like this. This is a shepherd. He goes away praising God because of the angel's announcement. You, be like that shepherd. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, I don't know where this lands for each of us. But God, I pray that we will, we will be as excited as heaven is as we think upon the incarnation in this season. That we will not just become busy with the food and the festivities, but our hearts will resonate with joy for the news that has come that has changed everything for us. Oh Lord, we desire to be a people that bring glory to you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>